The law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom treasures new and old. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, everyone. Happy 4th of July. Oh, I liked that. Everybody responded. That was great. Uh, Happy 4th of July weekend. Um, Hopefully you guys are safe this weekend as you light off fireworks. Don't do what I did when I was like 10. I started my neighbor's yard on fire. So don't do that. Um, But we won't talk about that story. Uh, (laughs) uh, Well, friends, over the last month, Uh, My daughter's now four months, and over the last month, Mariah, my wife, and I, we've been able to watch our daughter do new things, kind of transition and grow and learn, and lately, what she's been really interested in, and lately, what she's been kind of gravitating towards is her feet. Uh, And so, as she, like, sits up, and we're kind of holding her, because she can't hold herself up, she starts to look down, and she sees these things that are kind of wiggling, and her eyes just, like, it's super wide, and it's the cutest thing ever, and then she, like, her arms still shake, because she doesn't have a ton of control with them, and so she, like, goes to reach down, and sometimes when she goes to do it, she just, like, falls flat on her face. It's the funniest and cutest thing ever, but that's not the only thing she's been learning. Uh, She's also been noticing our dog. Uh, We've got a big Alaskan Malamute, and so as he kind of walks around the room and does his thing, she kind of starts to, like, see him, and she's just infatuated with him. You know, we were just sitting down in the living room, and she just could not take her eyes off of it. I mean, it was like five minutes where she was just plugged in, locked into the dog, and when he gets close enough, she starts to, like, stretch out her arms because she wants to pet him or she wants to feel his fur. The textures are kind of a new thing for her that she's wanting to explore. Um, And then earlier in the month, early June, uh, she started to roll over. And so she rolls over, which means, oh, shoot, she can't be in the bassinet anymore. She can't be swaddled. We've got to take her out of the swaddle, got to put her in her crib. And that's in a different bedroom where she's been. So it's a lot of new learning and different things. But something that's kind of funny, but also really sad at the same time is as she's rolling over and learning how to sleep in her crib, one thing that she does is she'll roll over too many times and she just kind of smacks her head on the crib wall. Or like sometimes her little arms will flail and it gets caught in between like the two crib slots. And it's it's kind of sad because she starts crying and it's really tough to put her back to sleep because she's scared and doesn't know what's happening. Um, But in all of that, she gets like these big, big tears that just well up in her eyes. And they're the cutest thing. It's like, you, you kind of want to like just hold her while she's crying because it's just so adorable to watch her. And she gets like the big bottom lip and she just keeps going. And I could go on and on. I could continue to tell you story after story after story of the new things that I'm watching my daughter do or just simply holding her. And, and I could continue to tol- tell you more things over, over, and over, time and time again, and you guys would probably get really tired of it. Half of you are probably like, I'm already tired of it. <laughs> and the truth is that I can have this conversation for hours. I can, I can keep going. Story after story, I can show you picture after picture. My phone has just exploded with pictures. I got no iCloud data left because all I'm doing is just taking videos and pictures of my daughter constantly, and I just want to show her off, and I just want to uh, tell people about her, and I have no fear at all being that dad who people are like, oh, how's your daughter doing? I'm going to show you a five-minute video of her just grunting. Uh, And you're just going to have to sit there and watch it because I think it's cute. Uh, And I have no shame with all of that. But that's all because I treasure my daughter. That's because I I value her. I care for her. I have so much love and affection for her that I want to show her off to the whole world. I wanted to have like a slideshow of pictures to show you guys. And I was like, they probably don't want to see that. So probably not. But the reality is we all have different things in our life that we hold and value and treasure that much. We have them so close to the heart, and they're clearly things that we would give everything for. I would lay down my life completely for my daughter. I would give up everything for my daughter and for my wife. And and we all have different things, whether it's your family, whether it's your job, your finances, your comfort. All of us have these things that we grip and we hold true to ourselves, and we say, this is the thing that I treasure most in my life. This is the thing that I will give up everything for. And today in Matthew chapter 13, what we're going to see is Jesus giving us four more parables to listen to where he tells us that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is worthy of everything. 
And what this scripture is going to convince us of and remind us of is the reality that we don't actually value the kingdom of heaven that much. Because we value the things in our life much more. We value the things of this world much more. And Matthew repeats this thing of the kingdom of heaven constantly because we need to be reminded of how valuable Jesus in the kingdom of heaven truly is. So uh, it's a question for us then to ponder as we read and study Matthew chapter 13 to ask ourselves. The question I want you to ask yourself this morning is, what is your treasure? What is your treasure? So let's dive in uh, to these first couple parables that Jesus gives us here, and uh, let's just see what Jesus is uh, instructing us. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls when he found one, one priceless pearl. He went and he sold everything he had, and he bought it. So the first point we see in the scripture today is that the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, the treasure of the kingdom. So uh, kids, I know you guys have your Bibles. If you want to open to page 950, I think it is, that's where we're going to be today. Parents, if you want to help your kids kind of find page 950, we do family Sundays, not because we simply just want to give like our kids volunteers a break or things like that, but we do family Sundays because we want to disciple our kids. We want to show them, hey, what's it look like to actually worship with the body of Christ? And this is why we gather here today. So if you've got kids, you can feel free to just track along with the scriptures so that they can follow along with us. And we've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew for several months now. Uh, I think the last break we took was like in January. And so we've been continuing to just work through the Gospel of Matthew. In the last couple of weeks, we've specifically been in this section of parables. Parables are these stories, these illustrations that Jesus is using to explain and teach us and to show us greater meaning to what they're actually painting for us. And so as we've looked at these parables, some of them can be really confusing. Some of them, can, uh, we can read them and kind of go, I, I don't know what this is trying to tell me. They can be hard to evaluate and, and, and grasp. So what is it exactly that Jesus is trying to show us through this? And Tom, who came and preached last week, he covered a bunch of them where he helped us uncover the greater meaning of some of those parables. And today, Jesus starts to end this section of the parable teaching uh, with these last four uh, parables. But they're different because they're pretty straightforward. You can read these and kind of directly evaluate and know this is exactly what Jesus is saying. It's not, you don't have to think about it too much when you read these. And so verse 44, he gives us this first parable where there's this man. He stumbles across this treasure in a field. He reburies it. And then he goes and he sells everything he has so that he can buy that land, so that he can own that treasure Rabbinic law would have dictated uh, that if a workman came across treasure and he lifts the treasure out of the field, that it technically would have had to go to either his master, who he was working for, or the person who owned the land. And so it can be kind of confusing to be like, well, why didn't he just take it in the first place? It's probably because he was a servant or he was working for somebody else, working in their field. So he reburies it so that he can buy the land, so that he could properly own the treasure that is there. The, the man doesn't just take it right away and kind of go, oh, I'm just going to run away with it. No, he goes about it kind of the right way as uh, Jesus instructs us here. And this man clearly saw that this was of great value. He said, this treasure is greater than everything else I possess. I mean, try to think through what is the one thing in your life that you would literally sell your house, your car, your, uh, your hobbies, all of your possess your clothes, what would you sell everything for? Because that's what this man does. He said, this is so valuable to me that I'm going to go buy land that I probably won't do anything with, but I see the treasure and I'm, I'm going to go get that treasure. I value it that much. And in the ancient world, they don't have banks. They, they don't have somewhere where they can go put it in like a, a CD or a mutual fund and they can gain some interest on it, you know. And so they have to bury their treasure in order to keep it safe. If you go to Matthew chapter 25, there's the parable of the talents. And as we read the parable of the talents, what's the one guy do that Jesus kind of rebukes? 
It, he buries it, right? Uh, and so we see this is what they do to keep and protect the things that they hold with high value is they put it in the ground so that nobody else can find it so that they can keep it safe to themselves. So that's kind of the first parable that he gives in verse 44. Then he goes into the second one in verse 45 and 46 that are super similar to this one. Uh, if you kind of read them, you're kind of like, this is basically the same thing. Uh, but we get this parable where there's the merchant. He's looking for pearls. The first one, the, the guy's not actively searching. He just kind of stumbles across it. Here, the merchant is clearly in search of a fine pearl. He's searching for something that holds great value, and he finds the one that he deems as priceless so that he could sell everything he owns to buy it, right, to possess it. And pearls are obviously of extreme value back then, and now today we probably don't think of, like, pearls right away, but uh, if you tried to go buy a necklace that's, like, real pearls, I'm sure it's going to be very expensive uh, for you to actually own that. And so the, the whole thing that Jesus is setting up up here in these first two parables is he's trying to show and tell us that the kingdom of God is valuable. The kingdom of heaven is worth everything. It's this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about it before as we've been walking through the gospel of Matthew. Just here alone in these verses, it continues to repeat that phrase over and over and over again. So if you've got your Bible, you've got a pen, underline that. Make sure to actually notice, hey, what is Jesus drawing us towards? Because if something is repeated, that means it's important. That means he's drawing our eyes to it. And we clearly see the main theme that Jesus is trying to teach us and to examine and to point us towards is the kingdom of heaven and what the value is of that kingdom. So as we've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew, I know we've kind of given a definition of the kingdom of heaven, but that was like five months ago. Um, so I'm just going to give that working definition again so that we have clarity because we can use church language all the time, right? We can say big words or big phrases and we're like, yeah, I know what that means. And then we actually really don't kind of on the, on the inside. We're like, wait, what? What does that actually mean? So when I say the kingdom of heaven uh, or the kingdom of God, it's God's redemption his reign and his rule over all of creation. God's redemption, his reign, and his rule over all of creation. So what started in the Garden of Eden and what will be fully restored and made new in the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus returns and restores all things, right? That, that's what he's pointing us towards, the fulfilled kingdom of heaven. This is what it's like. It, it's worth everything. That's the high value that we, he, Jesus is trying to tell us. It is worth selling out for completely. It is the greatest treasure that you could ever have, that these people are willing to sell their home, their food, their clothing, absolutely everything, so that they could have this one thing. So as we read these parables, Jesus isn't saying you need to purchase your way into heaven. He's not saying you, you can give enough money so that you could be saved. He's not saying that if you just make sure you buy things uh, or the right treasure, then he's going to let you into the kingdom. But what he is saying is if Jesus asked you to give everything in your life for something for him, would you? Would you actually sell out for the kingdom of heaven? I was talking to a, a college student yesterday on the phone, and we're kind of trying to get to know each other, and uh, he blew me away because he's way holier than I am, and uh, you'll see why here in a sec. But as I'm having a conversation with him and talking with him, I'm asking him questions of why he decided to go into like his major of engineering and different things, and he goes, well, when I was a senior in high school, I was trying to contemplate what field could I go into so that when I graduate, I could get a job anywhere in the world that would allow me to go to a place where there's an unreached people group so I could use that to leverage it for the gospel? Oh, <laughs> I was just like trying to make money when I decided on my college major, and I didn't go into it. <laughs> and, and I was just kind of sitting there, and I'm like, man, this, this guy is selling out for the kingdom. It, and for all of us. We're all probably comfortable, confident in our homes here in South Lincoln. If Jesus asks you to sell your house, sell your business, sell your car, and leave the States, or to just ask you to move to, I don't know, Greeley, Colorado, would you go? That's a hard question. I, I don't know that I would say yes. I'd be like, uh, I like my house. I like where we're at. I don't know that I want to sell everything to go. And again, this is a, a self-evaluating question for us to really consider. Do we actually see Jesus? Do we see the kingdom of heaven as that valuable, that it's worth everything in our lives, everything in our hearts? 
Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Again, he continues to just press on to us the great value of the kingdom of heaven. Anybody ever watch the show Shark Tank? Raise your hands. Yeah, Shark Tank. I love it. It's super fun. Mariah and I have recently gotten back into Shark Tank, and we have YouTube TV, so unlimited cloud, hashtag. Maybe I can get a sponsorship out of this or not, but they're probably not listening. Um, nope. Um, so uh, YouTube TV, right? So we record everything, and uh, we started all the way back to season one. There's, I think, like 14 seasons, so it's a lot. Um, and it's just fun to just kind of listen to uh, the different investors, like, bicker over things. It's also kind of fun to like go back and watch and see what stuff like actually blew up and what stuff didn't. Um, but as we're watching uh, Shark Tank, there's one thing that really irritates the panel of like investors, the sharks is what they call them. Um, and it's when a business owner comes in and has this valuation on there because they say, hey, I want $100,000 for 10% of my company. And some people will come in and they'll be like, I want a million dollars for 3%. And they're like, are you kidding me? Um, what? And they get really irritated by these extremely high values that they're, that they're being given. And often the sharks just get so mad that they just kind of start yelling at them over it. But uh, Kevin O'Leary, a.k.a. Mr. Wonderful, he's constantly the one who's totally ripping people to shreds on the show. And he's the one who really complains about valuations. He, he just thinks it's the most outrageous thing there is in the world when someone comes in and has like an extremely high value of their company, doesn't have have a ton of sales or maybe no proof of concept or whatever it is. But then there's Mark Cuban on the other side of the room. And Mark Cuban doesn't even care about evaluations. He, he says it on the show. He goes, we don't need to look at the valuation. What we need to look at is the product and the entrepreneur. And then how can we actually grow the business? And, and so these two are constantly bickering. You know, Kevin O'Leary will kind of step out of an offer. He'll say, I'm out if he thinks the valuation is ridiculous. And then Mark Cuban will kind of swoop in at last minute. And he's like, yeah, I'll give you a million dollars for 20%. And, and Kevin and Mark just basically bicker for five minutes on the show. And you're like, well, are they going to say yes? You know, I'm like, I don't want to hear the bickering. But um, as you're kind of watching it, you're, you're seeing, man, these two clearly value this differently. They, they want to look at the, the actual investment completely differently. So Kevin O'Leary, he's looking at it as sales, margins, and returns. Mark Cuban is looking at the company as a product, as people, and as growth. They're evaluating, evaluating it completely different to see, hey, where do they want to actually put their finances? Where do they want to make an actual investment? Where do they want to see a return of value, return of investment, right? So we today, in our current life, one way that we evaluate how much we care about something is what we're willing to pay for it. You guys ever go to garage sales and you're like, man, those socks are really cool. I'll give you a quarter for them. And then that person's like, no, these are my favorite socks, $5. <laughs> Why are you selling socks for $5? <laughs> but it, that's the reality it, is we value or we pay for something based off of what we value it as. So here's my question for you in the room today. What value would you put on your salvation? What value would you put on having fellowship with the King of Kings, the creator of the world, the God of the universe? What would you be willing to pay for it if it worked that way? It doesn't actually work that way. I love the way one pastor puts it. He says, the kingdom is a treasure that is rich beyond the comparison. It's incorruptible unfading, undefiable, eternal. It's like it's lying in a field of poverty-stricken, bankrupt, cursed world, free for us to take up. That's the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is right before our eyes right in front of us each and every single day where he's freely offering salvation for us to have eternity with him, for us to continue to see how valuable it is that we could have relationship with the true king of kings. The God of the world has come to save people who don't deserve it at all. 
So when we look at our lives, if you reflect on your last month, how did you value the kingdom? It's not a fun question to kind of ask, right? How did you value Jesus? There's a couple of different ways where we can see where we value things. One is our finances. Ta-da, giving sermon. Um, but just kidding. Uh, but seriously, in all honesty, as we, as we consider this, he's talking about treasure. So let's, let's look at one way we put our treasure, our finances, into somewhere. And we often get weary and cautious. And some of you maybe are like here for the first time. They're like, do they always talk about money? We don't always talk about it. But it's an area of discipleship that Jesus is asking us to give over to him to actually see. So uh, let's look at how Jesus is actually asking us to evaluate this. Are we merely investing in stocks, real estate, clothing, technology, food, possessions? Are we not being generous or making investments in the kingdom of God? Consider one worldly investment. It might have a really good return in 30 to 100 years. Consider the investment in the kingdom of God. Consider the investment in putting some finances to a missionary. He's going to go to an unreached people group. And because there's someone now there to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, hundreds of dozens of thousands of people's eternity might be changed. Not just a couple more bucks in the bank account. How do we value the kingdom of heaven? An eternal return of investment? Or do we want the short return of investment? Second way that we can evaluate uh, where our treasure is is our time. Uh, We can see how we value the kingdom by what time we're willing to give to things, by what time we're actually willing to spend uh, pursuing people for the kingdom of heaven or considering what God's doing in our life here today and now, or just evaluating how much time are we actually willing to continue to meet with God's people and to continue to do what God's instructed us to do. And so uh, are we using our everyday moments with family and friends and kids to actually make an impact for the kingdom. I see my brother maybe once every three, four months. They live in Lexington, so way on the other side of the state, way on the other side of the state. And as they were here last yesterday for lunch, and I was reading through my sermon after they left, and I read that section, and I was just like, oh, yep, um, mm, don't know that I... Tried to pursue my nephews and niece once to have like a gospel conversation with them or to see um, what God's doing in their life. Or my brother, I didn't evaluate and ask him how work is going to hope that we could uh, get to Jesus at some point. And, and these are questions we all have to ask ourselves. Oh, what kind of time are we willing to invest? What kind of time are we willing to say, hey, are we willing to give up an hour of our Sunday morning to serve in the kids' ministry and disciple the kids that are in our church? Are we willing to invest two hours on a Wednesday night to serve the high school kids of our church in middle school to make an impact for the rest of eternity in their own lives? Are we willing to sacrifice time when that one person in our city group says, hey, I'm having a plumbing issue and I need help trying to figure out how to put a new toilet in? That's usually me. Uh, And so, uh, like, are we willing to sacrifice our time for the kingdom of God? Right? These are all things that we should continually evaluate and ask ourselves, where could we invest for the kingdom? Granted, uh, given the, the reality, making financial like investments to secure yourself, it, good stewardship is a godly principle. So I'm not saying like, hey, you should never invest or things like that, but I'm, but I'm asking, is that the only thing you're considering? Or is the kingdom of heaven kind of the first thing that you're thinking of? Right? Because that should be the lens that we should be seeing our entire life with, with what the scriptures continue to open our eyes to, to who Jesus is and how we can continue to go, therefore, and make disciples. Jesus is the greatest treasure that we could ever have. Jesus is the one thing that maybe some of you stumbled upon and had no idea you were even looking for something. And someone walked up to you and said, can I tell you about Jesus? Maybe you were someone who for years 
was searching for that one pearl that you were willing to sell out for. You were searching after philosophy or religion or all these other uh, things that are part of our world and trying to make idols for yourself. And then you came to see the greatest treasure in the earth, Jesus himself. Where is it? Or where do we actually have our treasure? Because Christ is the greatest treasure we could ever find. The next parable shows us what the result of our treasure is. So let's read the next section, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea, collected every kind of fish. And when it was full, they dragged it ashore, they sat down, and they gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will go out. They'll separate the evil people from uh, the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The second point is the result of your treasure. Um, Yeah, so now I can actually say I don't just give away the hard passages to all the guest preachers and Ricky. Um, (laughs) So as we, as we look at this parable, we have this picture of a dragnet, right? It's out at sea, it's ga- ga- gathering all kinds of different fish. These fishermen, they go back to shore, and this is where they have to actually weed out. Hey, where are the good fish? Where are the bad fish? What are the ones that we can keep? What are the ones that we need to throw out? This parable then is followed up by Jesus giving the clear explanation of what this means to his listeners, and he's teaching them and informing them about the end of the age, right? And in fact, Jesus uses this language actually earlier in chapter 13, verses uh, 41 and 42. uh, Jesus continues to talk about this. He says, the son of man will send out his angels and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will throw they will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Almost identical to the same language he just used. It's repeated. So this dragnet is a picture of two boats who have this huge net in between them and they're fishing along and then they get back to shore and that's where they have all the fish that are gathered that is they've been out to sea and they have those large amounts and as we consider this passage and we see Jesus really is not sugarcoating it here he he is giving it plainly he's saying here it is there, there is no uh, kind of gray area for him as he's uh, teaching them what it means that uh, the angels are going to separate the evil from the righteous. Jesus clearly shows us here, hey, this is what's going to happen. The weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And um, we can see the emphasis with it that he wants us to pay attention to what this is because it's repeated. And, and it's in relationship to what we treasure, to what we value. And so we can see he's, he's trying to get us to actually say, hey, where is our treasure? Where is our value? What does it actually mean to be like a good fish or a bad fish? And the focus here is not on how to acquire the kingdom of heaven. That's not the focus of what Jesus is trying to show in verses 47 to uh, 40 or to 50. But what Jesus is trying to show here and what he's trying to emphasize is the fact that there will be a judgment. There, there will be a day where the angels are going to separate everything, right? There, there will be this time where the righteous and the wicked will be sorted. And we can honestly read these passages and get kind of scared or like, oh, I thought we were supposed to talk about happy stuff at church. I thought we were supposed to emphasize like a lot of these other things and just kind of walk away from that. I thought you were going to skip over that section and just get to the storeroom and the treasure. It, it's not a fear tactic, that Jesus is trying to use. It's not a fear tactic that I'm trying to use or that that I want to just hammer and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to terrify you into the kingdom of heaven. But it's something that Jesus says, hey, this is real. Judgment is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because that means we have a just God. That means we have a God who is true to what he says. So Jesus here shows that there's no middle ground. He doesn't say, hey, there's the good fish and the bad fish, and then the fish that I'll maybe think about later and kind of consider they're kind of good. He just says the righteous and the unrighteous. And as we sit here and we think, okay, that's kind of scary. That's heavy news. That's not fun to really consider and to think about. I love the way that John Piper uh, kind of discusses this and really how to discuss this with our kids and how to handle it with our kids and families. And I as really, I found this because it was like a kid's article. I asked our kids ministry team, hey, how, how can we talk about this with our kids in the room to make sure that we're caring for them and, 
Um, and they, Natalie sent me this article, and I was like, wow, that was good for my soul, not just for uh, the children in the room. But uh, as I consider this, he says it's healthy for us to actually fear death and hell. Because if we don't fear it, if, if we're not worrisome about it, that means we really don't care. That means we put no value on it, right? The fact that it shakes us up a little bit shows that we're like, whoa, we, we actually have to consider this. Like, this is a real thing that we have to think through and contemplate. And, and if we weren't, uh, if we had no compassion or we weren't worrisome about this at all, it would show our hearts. It would either mean that we didn't think anything of Jesus, or it would mean we'd think it was all fake. But the reality of reading this and going, oh, that's kind of tough news, it shows us that our hearts are prompted to go, we don't want that. We, we don't want that at all. And the parable shows us what the result of our treasure is. So as we consider this in our lives to, today, the question, are we 100% sold out for the kingdom of God like the guy above or the merchant or the, the guy who's working in the field? Probably not. I'm not. And I'm a pastor. I, I mean, I can confidently say that I know my heart. I, I know what I value. I know what I treasure. I know what I commit my time to. I know where my money goes. And as I think about all that, and if I was just left to myself, I would spend it all on me. I'd constantly buy, be buying possessions. I'd constantly be investing in things that were going to make me happy. But Matthew chapter 7 convicts me as I consider the treasure that God brings about there. And as we look at this, it's a reality that the things that we have that are part of this world are going to turn into rust and moth. They're going to be destroyed. They're not eternal. But as we consider the kingdom of heaven, it is. But because of that, we can read this parable, and I'm convicted. I read this, and I'm like, man, that's, I should definitely be the evil person that's thrown into the blazing furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But there's good news behind it all because I remember the one who's actually giving this parable. I remember that, that Jesus himself is the one who was completely sold out for the kingdom, He's the only one who completely sold out for the kingdom, and he did it perfectly. And because of that, we could be saved by Jesus. We could have salvation in Christ. It's a free gift that we did not pay for. He's the one who paid the price so that we could have eternity. He's the one who made the great investment to continue to pursue people, to seek and save the lost, to give them eternal life, not by some good works or some deeds or cleaning themselves up or having the right Bible answers, but by actually seeing him as our true treasure. By, by grace, through faith, we are saved. That's the greatest news that we could ever hear, that Jesus came to die so that we could have eternal life. Our treasure is found in Jesus. Friends, all of us, all of us deserve that separation. All of us deserve to be sent away from God and, and to continue to just not ever have a right relationship with him. How amazing is it that we have a God who came and pursued us, died for us, rose from the dead, defeated sin and death so that we could have eternal life with him, so that we could actually see him as the true treasure that we could have. That, that treasure then, the result of our treasure, the result of our faith is to actually trust in Jesus. So my hope is that if you've never trusted in Christ, that you would put your faith and in, in your, your trust in Christ today that you would give your life to him, that you would see him as the greatest treasure that you could ever have. And that treasure, that result leads us to continue to say, hey, then that means we got to show it off. That's what the next section says. So let's keep reading verse 51. It says, have you understood all these things? They answered him, yes. Therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a house who brings out his storeroom. He treasures the new and the old. So the third point we see in the text is to bring out your treasure. Jesus starts this last section of parables here, uh, and he kind of asks them, he's like, hey, do you understand? Because if you go back a little bit earlier, they don't understand some of the parables, and they're like, hey, can you explain that one to us again? So we see, okay, he wants them to actually get what they're saying. And he says, do you understand? And they all go, yeah. And then you keep reading the Gospel of Matthew, and you're like, I don't think they actually understood. Uh, but for whatever reason, Jesus just continues on here. And he concludes this final parable about the, the owner of the house who brings out the new and the old treasures, right? 
Jesus compares this to the scribes, right? The teachers of the law during that time. He, he's not referring uh, to like the actual scribes who are present there, but he's saying, hey, you disciples, my disciples, people who have trusted in me, people who are following me, you are like the scribes. You are like the teachers. You, are, you know the old, you know the new. And when he's referring to the old, he's referring to the Old Testament, the old covenant. And here he's saying, you know the new. I'm teaching you new, the new, the kingdom that I'm bringing, the reality that you could have salvation in me, that I'm the Messiah. And he's saying, you're claiming to understand. And because you're claiming to understand, Jesus then sends them out, not simply to understand and comprehend, but to actually bring out the treasure and to show it off, to show it off. And so that's something for us to truly consider too. Are we simply claiming to understand? Or are we following through with then the charge to also show it off? We have the greatest treasure in the world that Jesus is asking us to give to everybody else. The good news of Jesus is not something that was simply to be understood and kept to ourselves. Our faith is never only for ourselves. Our faith is never just a personal faith that we keep to ourselves. Our faith is actually something that we should go out to the ends of the earth, that we should be going to our neighborhoods, our, our coworkers, our friends, our family, people, that we should be bringing out the treasure and say, look what I have. Look at this thing that I got. I love how Jesus gets into this. He says, do you understand? I think that's one of the greatest questions that I've probably read and sat with and studied. As he slows down, stops and says, do you get what I'm saying? And I think it's the same question we continually have to ask ourselves. Do we understand what's at stake? Do we understand the value of, of the kingdom of heaven? Do we understand who Jesus is? Do we understand the urgency of the precious jewel that we own that we could continue to give to the rest of the earth? Because if we truly understood, I think we would be like this homeowner who brings out his treasure and shows it off to people. I have this weird thing uh, with an attachment to my possessions. I'm, I'm really fixated on the things that I own uh, for whatever reason. I value them. I care about them. I know how much money I spent on it. And I try to treat them with care so they don't break. And so if someone's borrowing my things, I tend to like up front kind of just be like, yeah, that was worth a lot of money and I really like it. And here's how I take care of it. And here's everything I do with it. And I say that all without kind of trying, I'm like being passive aggressive a little bit with it. It's probably not good. Uh, but I'm doing it all because I value it. And I'm like, please don't break my stuff. Don't mistreat it, please. Like, I really care about it. And it could be literally like a pair of socks. I don't know. Like the garage sale person. But as I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm contemplating and thinking about this, and I'm like, man, I have this weird attachment and idolization of the things I own, and it's because I find them so valuable. I want to protect them. I want to care for them. And at the same time, as I think about, like, the kingdom of heaven, man, I usually bring out and show off the things that I love. If I got like a new TV, I'm probably inviting everybody over. Hey, let's come watch the game. Everybody come downstairs. I got a new TV. You get a new car, guess what you're doing? I know you're posting that on social media. I know it. You buy a house, guess what? You're going to take that cool little family picture where you're outside and you're like, we're homeowners. Because you bought something that you invested in and you value it and you want to show it off to everybody. You start hosting people. You want to give them tours. You want to uh, show. I bought a new Bible and uh, I, I get really excited about my Bibles for whatever reason. My wife makes fun of me for it all the time. And I got a new one and I had my city group over and I was telling a couple of guys about it and I was like, oh, they're here. I got to show it to them. So I like ran over to my office and like I grabbed it and I brought it out. And I'm like, oh, look at my Bible. And they, they were just kind of like, oh. It looks pretty. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's like this, this crazy goat skin and blah, blah, blah. And they just don't really care because I value, you know, that's what we want to do with the things that we love, the possessions that we have. It's the same thing with my daughter. I want to show you all the videos, all the pictures, all the weird little cute grunts that she does, all the times that she poops all over the house. And it's just like, it's so cute because I care about it and I treasure it so much. How much more do we treasure the kingdom of God? How much did Jesus treasure us so much that he sold out completely and gave his life to pursue us so that we could know him because we need him? How much more do we look at what Christ has done for us 
and look at people who don't have him. Like when I see people who maybe don't have like the lawnmower that I've got, I'm like, you got to have this one. This one's going to give you the greatest cut on your yard. How often do I actually think, oh, like you don't have Jesus. You've got to have Jesus or else your eternity is just separated from him eternally. How much more should we value the kingdom? When we read this passage, it's clear. The argument is, we don't. But the good news is, Jesus is continuing to pour out grace on us, to show and reveal to us how much greater the kingdom of heaven is. One pastor put it this way. He said, the treasure fulfills our deepest passions. It calms our storms. It gives sight to the blind. He clothes the naked. He removes the stain of the guilt. The kingdom of God is like a pearl that sets the captive free, a jewel that's life, or a jewel that, that uh, lifts the yoke of slavery. It brings the dead to life and nothing on this world. Nothing on this world could compare to it. Friends, Scripture time and time again tells us God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Would you give your children for people who have walked away from you? Would you give your greatest possession for people who have abandoned you? God proved his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What amazing news that we have a God who sold out so that we could have eternity with him. He gave his life so that we could know him, be in a relationship with him. He paid the price so that we could inherit the kingdom of God. He was willing to pay the price with his own blood. Not because he needed us, but because we needed him. I love that Jesus doesn't challenge the disciples when he knows they're wrong. It's not like he doesn't. He knows that they don't understand. But he doesn't care about that. Instead of challenging them on on where their hearts are actually at. He charges them. You understand? Sweet. Go show it off. Go tell the world. Go be the homeowner who puts the picture on Facebook who says, I got a house. Look at it. Come over. I want to have you over for dinner. We close in 30 days. So for us today, church, the question to ask ourselves, do we understand? Where is our treasure? Do we value the kingdom of heaven? Is Jesus the greatest news that we have? Then let's bring it out to share. Let's pray. Jesus, you are uh, the greatest treasure. Whether we comprehend it or not, we know that it's true. Uh, Lord, I pray that in our hearts that you would move in such a way that you would stir our affections for you. Jesus, would we see that you are undefiled, unending, completely eternal, the greatest gift that we could ever receive, and that the things of this world are, are just temporary. You know, these are investments that are here to help us here today, but would we not make idols of them? Would we use them for your glory? Would we actually use those tools to continue to move forward and bring out the greatest treasure that we have, God? Would you give us hearts that see you as the greatest treasure that we could ever receive, whether we stumbled upon it or whether we were searching for you for years? God, I pray that you would continue to open our eyes and our hearts to value you as greatest of all, Lord. Would you do that in our hearts? Would we truly understand? It's in your name. Amen.